It is February the 2nd, and I failed to communicate this in the early service, but here's, here's this information came to me uh, just this week. Oh, Linda. You okay? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> All right. Today is February the 2nd, 2020. Do you know that forwards and backwards, is that called a palindrome? Is that right? The date is the same forwards that it is backwards. If you do 0202, which is February 2nd, 2020, you could turn it out, flip it around, and it's 0202, 2020. Isn't that interesting? First time that's happened in 900 years. The last time was like 1111, 1111. I know, it's just, you're done founded, aren't you? Yes. This is, uh, this is, this is what I hope, you know, I could just like speak and y'all are just going, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's so nice, what a beautiful day, it's springtime in Iowa, and uh, we're, we're loving it. We encourage you today, if you are a member for sure, we need you to be at the business meeting. These, this is when you signed up to be an official member and went through that process, today is the day that you signed up for. I mean, you're saying, I identify with this church, I believe what this church believes, and I'm going to be there for the business meeting because we got, we got business to do, We've, we're electing deacons, and that takes official members to do that, and we need a certain amount of people to be there to have a quorum so that we can actually do business. Now, our business meetings are very, very encouraging. And if you haven't been, I encourage you to come. Even if you're not a member, we encourage you to come. I'd love to see the place filled because what we're going to be doing is just reporting on what God has done over the last year. And God's done some amazing things. And uh, so today you're going to hear when you come to the business meeting, missions, we actually went over a million dollars this year. So we're thankful to God for what he has done, what he's doing around the world and using us uh, to be able to do that. And so um, not, not just the finances, but God's, God's doing a, a great things in our church, in our community, and we encourage you to come be part of that today. Pastor Weaver has always threatened, you know, our business meetings are not contentious in any way, um, but, you know, he's threatened many times that we could orchestrate a fight so that we could get people to come. We don't have those kind of fights, and so everybody's like, yeah, you know, but it's a, it's a great time as we come. We're going to be sharing communion together and uh, just giving thanks for what God has done and ex excited as we look forward to the future. So this morning I am going to be uh, continuing in our series that we started a couple of weeks ago in the red letters. A couple of weeks ago we started with uh, the parable of the soils, looking at the condition of our heart and that our heart would be good soil where the seeds of the word could, could land in that place and be able to take root and grow and, and grow in us what God wants to do in and through our lives. And so um, that happened two weeks ago last week. Pastor Austin was talking about the vine, Jesus being the vine. We're the branches. If you missed that message, I encourage you, you can go back on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, search New Hope Assembly Urbandale, and all of our past messages are on there. Or you can go to our website always. There is a, a, a link at the bottom that says stream our services live. You can get the whole service there, even archive services. So, but if you want to go back and catch one of those two, if you miss those, I encourage you to go back. And there is definitely a theme uh, that is uh, kind of weaving through uh, these messages so far as we look at the words of Jesus, the, the words that are in red, and some of your Bibles are red letter edition Bibles, any of the words that are in red are actual words that Jesus spoke. And so we're looking at what did Jesus say, and that's what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. But I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, and if you'll uh, just hold that there, we'll get there eventually. And um, I've got a little bit of groundwork that I want to do before we actually read that passage of scripture in Matthew 25. I want to start this morning by asking a question, and the question is this, what do you have to do to get to heaven? What do you have to do to get to heaven? I think most of us would agree that that is a very important question to ask. I think if you uh, ask most people, if you went on the, on the street and polled people about what you have to do to get to heaven, you're going to find people saying that I, I, I think being a good person, and I think most people think this, that being a good person and, and doing good things, as long as my good outweighs the bad, that's how I get to heaven. 
But if you're a student of the Bible and you've been around here at New Hope and you've been part of the preaching and teaching here, you know that that's not true. Being a good person doesn't get you to heaven. You can't earn your way to heaven. None of us are good enough. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. None of us meets God's standard. God is a holy and a pure God. And his requirement is holiness. It's moral perfection. And the reality is, is that none of us live up to that standard. Paul says this in Romans chapter 3, a few verses of scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. No one is righteous, not even one. There is none righteous. Romans 3, 20, he says, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows how sinful we are. Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And the psalmist wrote in Psalm 133, Lord, if you kept the record of our sins, who could ever survive? It isn't that the truth. If God were keeping a record of all of our sins, there's not one of us here that could stand. There's not one of us that would survive. So what is the answer to that question? That's just it. Unless some other provision is made, not one of us could stand. Not one of us could survive. No one is good enough to enter heaven. We're all doomed. And you're saying this morning, man, that's great news, Pastor Jeff. The come and get this word that we're all doomed, that none of us can earn or get our way to heaven. But that's the bad news, and it's very bad news. See, the reality is is none of you in the room here are an exception to that rule. I'm not an exception to that rule. There's no one ever that's been an exception to that rule other than Jesus himself. According to God's standard, there's no one righteous, not even one. We all fall short. But the good news is that although you can't be good enough to earn your way to heaven, you don't have to. You don't have to be good enough. Jesus has done all the work on our behalf, and through faith, his righteousness and his holiness are allocated to us. Our account is credited by Jesus. So he takes his righteousness and he credits it into your account. It's a great thing. His perfect obedience to God is viewed as if it were ours, and our sin likewise was transferred to him. Martin Luther called this the wonderful exchange. Jesus' righteousness and his holiness put into our account in exchange for our sin. It's a crazy, crazy uh, exchange. You see, the reality is today with a Super Bowl going on, there's going to be a lot of people betting money and they're looking for a sure way that they can put money down and get some money back. I'm telling you that there's no greater deal than the deal that God offers to us in this great exchange of saying, look, you just give me all your junk and all your sin and what I'll give to you is my holiness and my righteousness so that when God sees you, it's like he's seeing you like he's seeing his son Jesus. Perfection. Perfection. That's a great deal. And I would encourage you today, if you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, that is the greatest thing that you can do. And I would say, don't leave here today without knowing for sure that you're in on that deal. If there is a good deal somewhere to be had, and I could tell you, if you just go to this store, you pay this price, and this is what you get, I mean, you calculate that and go, you know what, that's worth it for me. But I'm telling you, just in light of the fact that none of us can earn heaven, that we're only... We're, we're bound to whatever he can do for us, whoever can take our place. And that's what Jesus did for us. And he has given us this wonderful exchange. Jesus died to pay the penalty, not for his own sin, but for ours. And Paul stated it this way, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the way we claim that righteousness and that holiness of Christ is through faith. Galatians 2.16, Paul says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Paul also says in his letter to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 21 to 25, but now God has shown us 
a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. That's amazing. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This is the essence of the gospel. So today, if you have never placed your trust in Christ to be forgiven of your sins and assured of a a place in heaven for your eternal home, today is your day. It doesn't happen by trying harder at being a good person, not by giving money to the church, not by praying more. It doesn't come by doing or not doing something. It happens simply by trusting Christ for salvation, and that's it. Nothing more. In the Reformation, these key gospel truths were referred to as the solas. So going back to the 1500s with Martin Luther. Here's, here were three Latin terms. Sola gratia, sola fida, solus Christus. Which means in English, only grace, only faith, only Christ. It's grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. We are saved by grace alone. It's a gift from God. And it comes through faith, not a result of anything that we have or haven't done. And it's only in Christ. We're saved solely on the basis of the work of Christ. His holy life, his substitutionary work on the cross, dying in our place, and his victorious resurrection. That's what we believe. We affirm, we teach these things, these doctrines, and it's without hesitation or reservation. That is the gospel in a nutshell. And you're saying, Pastor Jeff, that's, that's 101. But I think, you know what, there are a lot of people that are not getting that right. There are a lot of churches, a lot of people teaching something other than that. Or, or making it so simple that the gospel, you just believe and just, you know, the great thing is, is that it just takes believing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. But what does it mean to believe? It's more than just thinking something it's more than just intellectually saying that the demons believe that so i want you to keep this in mind that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone because we're going to look at these uh some scriptures these red letter words of jesus in matthew 25 and and i'm guessing that as we get started in this you're going to start feeling this sense of um, conflict. And you're going to say, okay, wait, you just went through all of this talking about salvation being grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. And it might seem, as we read the scripture, that there's a little bit of conflict. But in order to be mature in our thinking, complete in our understanding, we need to look at the whole Bible. And we shouldn't shy away from this, but this teaching of Jesus is probably the last teaching before his crucifixion. If you just turn from Matthew chapter 25 to 26, what we see is the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this is some of the last days that Jesus was on earth, some of his last teaching that he gave, and it's worth it for us to sit up and take notice. Two weeks ago, I talked about the parable of those soils, probably the first parable that Jesus taught. So we're looking at some first words and some last words, but listen and read along with me. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31 to 46, all red letters of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. So in my Bible, it says that Jesus tells about the final judgment. So in your Bible, it either says final judgment or it probably says sheep and goats. One of those two things. But we're looking at end time type stuff here. We're looking at the final days. We're looking at at judgment. Everything is over. It's all said and done. And this is what's going to happen. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as as a shepherd separates the sheep 
from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came and visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? Did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but to the righteous, to eternal life. So in light of what I've been talking about just the last few minutes, teaching about salvation being by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I don't know if you sense a little bit of conflict here. Seems to be a problem. It seems that Jesus is determining our destination of heaven and hell based on what we do or don't do. We just read several verses, and there are a whole lot more. They're they're clear, they're undeniable, that what the Bible teaches is salvation through grace, by grace, through faith, not by works. Let me just share one more. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. But when God our Savior revealed His kindness and love, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away your sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. But what did Jesus just say in Matthew 25? He says to the one group on his right, the sheep, he says, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. While to the goats, he utters these dreadful words, which I pray that none of us ever hear directed toward us. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So what distinguishes those two groups of people? What determines if they, or if you or I, are among the sheep on his right hand, or the goats on his left? Whether we will receive his blessing, or his curse. And the answer from this passage of Scripture is what clearly distinguishes them. What distinguishes those two groups of people is what they have done or what they haven't done. To those on his right, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. Those on his left, he said, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. Thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't come look after me. So does Jesus say anything in this passage of Scripture, in Matthew chapter 25, about faith? Did you hear anything in what Jesus was saying, talking about the sheep and the goats, separating sheep from goats, and the the ones that fed him and, and gave him something to drink, the ones who didn't? And he said, if you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. If you didn't do it to the least of these, then you didn't do it for me. And then there's, then there's the judgment. There's blessing or curse. Where did you hear about faith in that passage of Scripture? 
it seems as if the sheep get into heaven by their works. You'd think Jesus would say, those who have been saved by grace through faith, come take your inheritance, right? But he doesn't say that. This is the final judgment. He's separating sheep from goats. He's talking about heaven and hell. But does he say anything here about faith? The answer is yes. Might seem like a trick question. Yes, Jesus is speaking about faith. No, he doesn't use the word faith. He doesn't have to because the actions that he is referring to is the evidence of faith or the lack of it. You see, faith demonstrates itself by action. Faith shows itself by what it does. I want to explain it like this. The sheep didn't get to heaven and didn't get their reward based on what they did. They didn't earn their place in heaven. They didn't get to heaven uh, by, by what they did. They get to heaven because of who they are. And who are they? They're sheep. There's a difference between sheep and goats. Through the Bible, there's a lot of talk about sheep and shepherds. We're called sheep. Jesus refers to us, his followers, as sheep. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, meaning we're sheep, right? Right? Psalm 103, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. John chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, the sheep, Jesus is saying this, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. He goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. It's talking about a relationship here. A shepherd and his sheep. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me so these sheep aren't given their reward based on what they do they get their reward based on who they are and they are sheep they've trusted in christ they've been forgiven they've experienced salvation and the way that they live their lives the things that they characteristically do are things like feeding the hungry giving water for someone to drink, caring for strangers, remembering those who are sick. Those things are the outward expression of an inward reality. And on the other hand, to ignore the needs of those people who are hungry, thirsty, and and those in need, to close your eyes to them is to ignore those needs. It's the evidence also of an inner spiritual reality. Their identity is a goat, someone who's never experienced the spiritual transformation that comes through faith in Christ. So I want to put it another way. You don't get to heaven because of what you do. You just don't. Salvation is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 said it's by grace that you're saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift from God not by works, so that none of us can boast. You get to heaven because of what the things that you do reveal about who you are. It's about who you are. It's a subtle distinction, but a critical one. James expresses it like this in James 2, 17 and 18. Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, James says, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. In other words, a genuine, living, active faith produces good works in our life, such as caring for those who are in need. That's how our faith is demonstrated. That's how faith reveals itself. Sheep do sheepy things. They, they do what sheep do because that's who they are. Goats do goaty things. I don't know. So James and Jesus are, are making the same point that true faith produces good deeds, good works. 
If there's no deeds, no good works, it doesn't mean that you have lazy faith. It doesn't mean that you have an underachieving faith or you have an intellectual versus an active faith. It means that you have dead faith. It's just plain dead. It's like having no faith at all. It isn't the deeds or works that save us. We don't earn our salvation. Those things are the evidence of what does save us, which is our faith in Jesus Christ. What we do reveals who we are. What's on the inside of you is going to come out of you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says, our mouth speaks. Jesus teaches in another place that the type of fruit that we produce reveals what kind of tree that we are. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 to 20. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Pastor Austin last week was talking about the fruit. The only way we're going to have good fruit is to be planted in a good place, in good soil, where we've got got water and we can continue to produce and produce and produce. But it says here, you identify them by their fruit, that is by the way that they act. Can you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. Fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. That sounds like judgment. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. It's not up to us to be the judge. See, we're, we're, we're looking at the fruit, we're looking at the people's actions, but it's not up to us to be the judge. That's Jesus' job. But what we need to do is examine our own self, examine our own heart, examine our actions, examine the fruit of your own life. So as we kind of try to wrap this up, I want us to understand that the actions that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 25 are not optional. These actions that he's talking about that brought them uh, their reward, their eternal reward. They're not just good ideas. They're not just some suggested ways which Christians can go about doing good if we happen to have the time or we feel so inclined to do so. If you've paid attention, I've, I've repeated it several times, there's only six different actions that they give. Feeding people, giving a drink, clothing, taking them into your home, visiting sick people, visiting people in prison. Six things. Those are things that anybody can do. You don't have to to be wealthy to do that. You don't have to have an education to do that. You can give somebody food. You've got some yourself. You can give somebody clothes. You've got plenty. There was a a call on uh, our Facebook group about um, a need at Jensen Elementary. And I know Jody Nuss works there and and is kind of the point person, but there's students who need snow pants and snow boots. And she said this morning, we've nearly supplied everybody just through people's responses from New Hope. So I want to say thank you and commend you for being a church that rises to the occasion. It's not hard to... Um, you know, some of you, 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 your kids are in their 30s now, so you got a, like a pair of 12 snow pants still somewhere in a box or in a, in a tub somewhere. Just pull those out and let somebody else use them. They're still good. We, uh, we, uh, we're part of the Urbandale Food Bank, and, you know, we have food drives. Uh, John and Susan Crookshank are our leaders in that, and you guys have done a tremendous job, and I know that they're always excited to see when we come delivering when we have a, a food drive weekend, but I, I still have to stop and ask this question. What if we all participated in that? What if we all did? What if we didn't just open our, um, our uh, pantries and say, you know what, I haven't, that's been on there for a year and a half, I'll give that away, or... That, uh, I didn't really like that anyway. I don't know how it got in my, how it got in my pantry. I'll give, give them that. But if, you actually, if we all actually just said, Let, I'll just go spend $10 and get some groceries 
and we'll donate that to the food bank. There is not enough room at the Urbandale Food Bank to hold all of that. But wouldn't that be a blessing? I'm excited and thankful to be part of a church uh, that, that serves and gives and does these things. You know, we, we give money to speed the light. We've built uh, water wells in Africa. Clean drinking water for people who would never otherwise have that kind of, that kind of benefit. But there's always, always something that we can do. And any of us can do it. But it's not just those six things. There's literally tens of thousands of things that we could do to express our faith in Christ, to minister and bless other people around us. If we realize that the people that we are serving and helping are actually Jesus. When we're doing it to them, we're doing it to him. I think it's interesting, and I never really realized this until I was reading this passage of scripture this week, that when Jesus is talking to the sheep on his right, and he said, you, you did this, you, you fed me, and you clothed me, and you gave me drink, and, and uh, all these things. What's their response? Their response is, when did we ever do that? Help me, help me remember, because I don't remember doing that. Isn't that interesting? I think the response was because they were just being who they were supposed to be. They weren't thinking, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm earning some brownie points on my salvation chart here. You know, I gave some money to the food bank or I let this guy come into my home and gave him some clothes or, or whatever it might be. They weren't even thinking about that. They saw a need, they just met it. They weren't even remembering when they did these things. It's because it was their nature. You see, when, when Christ comes into our life, there's a complete transformation that takes place. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that the veil is removed and we're face to face with Jesus Christ and we become changed more and more into his image through that relationship. It's not just what we do, it's who, who we are. So if we're ignoring the people who, around us who are in need, I'm going to be just a little blunt here. If we're ignoring the people around us who are in need and we're focusing on our own little concerns and our own little world, then we have good reason to be concerned about the, the place of our soul, the condition of our soul. Because ignoring the needs of those around us is not what sheep do. It's what goats do. These things are important because, like I said, there's a transformation that takes place when we put our faith in Christ. We're changed from people who are fundamentally self-centered, focused on what we want and how we feel, and put, habitually put our own needs and our own desires in front, of, in, the, in front and center. And we're changed into people who are like Christ. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 6. We're going to end with this, with this passage of Scripture. Jesus gave up everything. He gave up his own life so that you could experience eternal life. These are red letter words of Jesus. Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 27. But to you who are willing to listen... Are you willing to listen today? He says, to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when... Things are taken away from you. Don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. If you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies, 
do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate as your Father is compassionate. So it's really about being more like Jesus. The sheep in this passage, it was just their nature. They just did those things. But there's a difference between sheep and goats. Part of this story that really bothers me, and I don't know if it bothers you, but there's a difference between sheep and goats. This is judgment right here. He says to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm not okay with that. That's not going to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to you. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, you did not look after me. They reply, Lord, when did we see you in all these conditions and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away into eternal punishment. I'm looking for eternal life, not eternal punishment. And that's what's offered to us today. Do we want to be a sheep? Are we going to be like sheep? Or are we just going to be the goat who just goes about his own way, doing his own thing, caring about his own little world and his own problems, and don't bother me with any of that? How many of you want to be sheep? How many of you in this room are sheep? And you're looking for a reward. This is what I want to do and ask for a response this morning. If today you're saying, I'm a sheep, or that's what I want to be, I want to be a sheep, I don't want to be a goat. If you want to be a sheep, you are a sheep. I want to invite you just to stand where you're at. This is the eternal reward or eternal punishment. This is what we're talking about, okay? This, what I expect the response to be here today is you say, of course I'm not looking for eternal fire in hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not choosing that. But here's the deal, you're a sheep. You do sheepy things. You're looking out and you're saying, you know what, I'm here to bless other people because Christ gave mercy to me. I'm giving mercy to other people. Because Christ loved me, I'm gonna love other people. Because Christ forgave me, I'm gonna forgive everyone. And you say, but you don't know what happened. It doesn't matter. He said, look, if somebody takes something that belongs to you, leave it alone. That doesn't really make sense to us, but a lot of what Jesus says doesn't make sense, but he's right. He's right. He's always right. So this morning, you're standing. I want to invite you just to bow your heads with me because if you're standing this morning saying, I want to be a sheep, some of you already are, but maybe there's some people in the room you're saying, Pastor Jeff, I've never made this decision before. I've never said I want to follow Jesus. That's what sheep do. Sheep follow their shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. And today you're saying, for the very first time, or maybe I'm making a decision today to give my life back to Christ. With every head bowed and your eye closed, I want to ask, if that's a decision that you're making today, would you just raise your hand and look up at me saying, Pastor Jeff, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Looking at my right and your left. Anybody? Thank you. In the center, looking to my left and your right. Is there anybody over here? You just raised your hand saying, I'm making that decision today. And I'm going to follow Christ. This 
is life and death stuff. Jesus, I pray for every person in this room that raised a hand, every person that's standing. And we're saying, Jesus, we choose to follow you. We choose to listen to you. We choose to be compassionate as you are compassionate. We choose to be loving as you have loved us. We choose to forgive as you've forgiven us. We choose to show grace as you have given us grace so freely as a gift. We choose to show mercy as you have given mercy. I pray that, God, you would transform our hearts and our lives to make us more like you, that day by day, as we listen to your voice and we've we are obedient to what you tell us to do, that we will grow and become more like you and we'll be like those sheep in the story that didn't even realize that they were doing these things. It was just their nature. God, help us. Transform us so that we can go and transform the world around us. In our community here and around this nation and around the world, God, that you would use us New hope in Urbandale. God, I pray that we can have confidence about our future because of who you are. Help us to listen to your voice and to follow you in all that we do. It's in your name that we pray.